Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Martin Ramsey with the LAMP Consortium, and this is the Lightning Talks Round 1. We have two rounds today, uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. If you're in the United States, if you're in Europe, they're probably both in the evening. <laughs> and Patrick's showing off his shirt. Um, Lightning Talks are this wonderful format uh, that Wilma has. I guess you can't take credit for Lightning Talks, Wilma, but uh, she certainly promoted them, and they seem to work really, really well. Um, each of our presenters yeah. will have nine minutes, only nine minutes, and that means that when I um, am getting close to time, I'm going to give you a sign like it's time to shut it down, and um, if I get really desperate, I may even put this slide back on the screen, but basically, limit your, your presentation to nine minutes, those of you who are presenting, that and that includes email. question and answer, and we find that people yeah, like having time email. to talk back and forth that you sent oh. with the list of all the so, employees okay that needs to be so we need to mute something um anyway so i'm without further ado i'm going to turn things over to our first presenter patrick masson who is the aperio foundation hello all i'm just getting uh my screen ready hello and can folks see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so yes, I'm Patrick Masson. I'll put my email there um, as well for folks who have questions. I'm currently the executive director for the Para Foundation. Thank you, Wilma, and the Sakai Virtual Conference um, Planning Committee for inviting me to uh, join you today. And I just thought I'd give a little update about a Perio Foundation from a, from a foundation view. Um, and sort of what's impacting the uh, directions and the discussions that are happening at the board and that might impact different projects in different ways, but should span the entire foundation. So quickly, nine minutes. Uh, first, uh, I want to talk about some of the new drivers. And the first one probably isn't new. It's, it's uh, campuses ongoing and increasing development of other open initiatives. So open access journals and open data and open science and open textbooks and all the other opens that are happening. That awareness of openness is definitely increasing interest in and development of open source software, which obviously Aperio and Sakai community are interested in. Um, part of that is triggered through new government requirements. And these are just in the US, but if you're into Europe or other jurisdictions, you'll probably recognize many of these same initiatives. Uh, open licensing requirements from the Department of Education, code.edu uh, for the federal government, um, open data and open science requirements uh, are now part of uh, federal granting and funding initiatives from the Department of Education, uh, National Health Institute, National Science Foundation, and others, where any federal dollars spent uh, require any outputs uh, made uh, be open and accessible to uh, the broader community. Um, Another new driver is that uh, open source is no longer seen as new and novel. It's sort of the de facto. In 2012, Wired Magazine said open source won. So that's changing the way institutions are engaging with open source, not just as, as enterprise platform tools like um, Sakai or other Apera projects like Uportal and, and Xerti and, and things like that, but also um, as components. Um, there's a... There's a a uh, pretty popular quote now that 97 from Synopsys that 97% of software includes open source code. Um, and that same report highlighted the prevalence of open source in ed tech. So the top, uh, the grayish line there is how much open source is, or how much ed tech or open, or sorry, uh, ed tech software is, uh, uh, using open source and the bottom uh, sort of green or lighter color there is how much include open source code. And so, again, it's not just that there's open source enterprise applications. There are open source components being used. And there's the sort of now famous uh, uh, cartoon there. And, you know, what open source tool is buried deep in the stack or a, a dependency of a dependency of a dependency. Um, so that's also changing the way. Uh, organizations like higher ed are, and are thinking about um, open source. Um, add to that and these dependencies, uh, the new, and this is just US uh, based uh, regulation and legislation coming out of the White House, uh, the Senate, um, all sorts of uh, federal and um, state regulations are being developed uh, around uh, the use of open source to offset 
uh, vulnerabilities that are perceived through the log4j and heart bleed and and just the curl lib uh, 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 issues that popped up even last month. So these are just the ones uh, from the last couple years uh, and how will universities and projects uh, react to these uh, upcoming uh, issues around regulation and legislation. Um, another new initiative or uh, something emerging, and this came out of you know, industry uh, is the emergence of the open, academic open source program office. Um, here's just some uh, statistics on the growth of uh, open source program offices. Uh, and then uh, recently Sloan Foundation has given, I think it's maybe up to $10 million by now. And this, this is not a complete list anymore of all the universities and colleges that now have open source program offices uh, on campus. And so the question is, what is their role? How are they interface with projects both emerging out of the campus, but also uh, projects that uh, the campus is using that are developed by third parties like Aperio. Um, so looking at all of this, um, Aperio as a foundation is looking at different uh, types of memberships or engagement with the community. Can Aperio uh, be a foundation as a service, essentially um, providing campuses who might be using open source but not developing, um, resources to help them authentically engage with the open source community. What about uh, OSPO as a service? So for those campuses that are developing open source software that are emerging out of research projects, are there services and community that could be provided to those campuses so that they uh, drive sustainability and maturity of their internally developed open source projects? Um, extended fiscal sponsorships. So um, are there services that Aperio can be offering that help projects. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about is we've invited uh, Josh Barron back to the Apera community. Some of you might remember him from the way back in the founding days. He just left the Gates Foundation and is working with us on um, finding grants and funding and sponsorship. So obviously this applies to the um, Sakai community and helping them uh, raise money for development. Um, other opportunities or other services we might offer is uh, uh, um, licensing and, and legal services or um, event planning and so on. So are there services that Aperio can offer that would be beneficial to uh, campuses as they engage in open source uh, development? Uh, there's others there uh, that you'll recognize the sponsor program sponsors, typically what we're already doing now with um, campuses that are supporting projects like Sakai, Friends of Aperio and so on. Uh, so the next big thing I wanted to talk about if I have time is um, a report that uh, we'd like to do with the broader open source software community and uh, broader higher education community. Currently, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of data uh, around the actual use of open source software in higher ed, uh, what's being used, where it's being used, how it's being used. And there's an actually a sort of belief uh, or a, a, a common uh, thought that, well, open source has had its prime and yeah, we use it, but it's not a big thing anymore. All the things I just talked about before, I think, highlight that these things are actually, uh, uh, all those issues that are coming will actually impact not only the open source community, but the higher education community that relies on it. So what we want to do is we want to uh, organize a, a research project for four parts. The first one is uh, asking current IT leaders um, uh, across institutions, what their perception is open source is, and sort of get a baseline of, of the higher ed community's understanding and use and interests and uh, issues with open source. Second, uh, we're going to find a, a statistically significant number of uh, campuses across uh, higher ed, not just in the US, but Asia and, and Africa and, and Europe as well. And we're actually going to hit those IP addresses or of .edu domains and see what's running to get an actual snapshot of how campuses are using open source, what they're using. Next, uh, working with a, a GitHub, we're going to and other repositories, a company called Baturgia that does this work. Um, we're actually going to scan uh, 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 code repositories uh, to see what universities are using, what how much are institutions actually developing. You know, if they're in GitHub or GitLab or wherever they might be, then the folks on their campus are actually developing this. Interestingly, we did a little test run with the uh, UC San Diego and the Center for Supercomputing, and they found 32,000 repositories. Now, obviously, that's an outlier because it's a computing center. But what is the level of adoption or, excuse me, a level of a development that's occurring across higher education? This research will uh, identify that. And the fourth part will be to assess uh, 
current jobs in higher ed. So scanning open positions and job descriptions, we'll look for the open source tools that are in most demand by employers, the universities. So are they Python, Kubernetes, Linux? What is it? If you're hiring open source talent, then you must be using open source tools. So those are the four parts of the research. Uh, the next big uh, uh, thing I'd like to ask of you is if your campus or if you know an organization that's interested, I invite you to join. Please contact me. I can give you more information. And with that, I think I'm done. Yeah. How'd I do? You, you did well, right at the time. <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Next up, we have um, Adam Marshall, who um, I, I razzed him. This one is pre-recorded. So I was going to say, play. he's not really here, so don't be fooled. <laughs> so yeah. go ahead, Wilma. We'll go ahead and let uh, Adam talk to us virtually. All right. Let me make sure I'm sharing sound. Uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but um, I, apparently it's okay to record uh, my talk. So I'll try and squeeze it all into the allotted time, see how it gets along. So anyway, what I wanted to talk to you about was the Contact Us tool, because I think it's brilliant. And uh, it's not because uh, I was the person who designed it or anything, it's just, just a really good tool. So hopefully I'm going to um, enlighten you all and to tell you a lot of things that you didn't know about uh, the Contact Us tool. So, um, right, so the history of it then is, as I said, it was originally developed by, um, well, it wasn't developed by me, it was uh, kind of planned by me uh, from Oxford University. And one of the reasons, or actually the main reason for doing it was because we were just getting fed up with getting tickets to the central service desk about things we couldn't answer. There's loads of questions about a course, you know, about broken links on a course. Oh, you've got this fact wrong in this on this page on your course. I can't access the course. Uh, things like that. Um, and we realised that you know we, there was a big delay really in um, being able to answer the students um, because they were coming to us and not to the person who could actually help them with those three things listed above. So we wanted to uh, resolve things a lot quicker. But actually. Um, the whole contact us to process makes things easier for the end user as well so um it's a, it's a win-win situation so so what does it do i mean i'm sure most of you've seen it but i thought i'd just go through it in case you hadn't never noticed it um so it allows um student queries to be uh, raised it allows uh, queries about guidance on how to use Sakai to be raised. It allows bug reports to be raised. Of course, there can't be many of those, can there? And w one of the things we used to do with it is point people to a suggestions box. We used to have a user voice, a free user voice account, where people could uh, suggest improvements uh, you know, to, the, to the Sakai tools or anything, really. And as far as I know, uh, I suppose I should have put a bit of disclaimer on this, uh, there's no other LMS with a similar thing. So this is what the Contact Us tool looks like. I, I quite like dark mode um, in Sakai, so it's in dark mode. So um, these are the, the four sort of areas I mentioned. And so you can change this text uh, yourself. Um, I'll uh, sort of touch on that briefly later on. So the first column is some kind of problem with the content, and you might want to contact the site owner or uh, one of the sort of tutors on the site for that one. Um, you can just ask for help. So generally, the asking for help would probably go to the service desk, as would the reporter technical technical problem. As I said, suggest improvements would go to a, an improvements form or something like that. So the, the first one is the one where students can opt to send to a um, lecture on the site. And I realise I haven't actually got a screen for this, but uh, you basically, as I have. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. I do apologise. Anyway, you can tell it's live, can't you? So the questions that um, you know we always had to ask students when they got in touch is which which course are you talking about? They just write saying, oh, you know, there's a problem, and they wouldn't say what course it was or what the URL was. Wouldn't say what the browser was. Wouldn't say what their username was, and they probably send it from like their Gmail account and not the university account, and certainly never told us what plugins they were using. But that isn't a problem because when your student fills in this form, so this is the form you get to when you've clicked on. Um, that the first box, you know, ask the um, 
actually yeah, any of the boxes to be honest uh, when you ask a question to somebody so here i have put a witty uh, summary of the problem there and um you can put anything you like in that box really and you can um add an attachment up to 10 megabytes um so uh, let's just assume that i've clicked on the submit button and this is the email you'll get so it's a little bit ugly but actually it's a mine of information you see it basically scrapes all the information that is sent with a web request so none of this is in any way sensitive it's every single web request you make sends this information um, so we can tell when it was, who they are, what the site was that they were complaining about, what plugins they've got installed, I haven't got that many, and what the browser was. So often that's all you really need, you know, oh, you're using an unsupported browser kind of thing. And then obviously you get the summary and there would be an attachment um, of if the uh, person clicking the button had added an attachment. So what we did at Oxford is we added it to every site, just like Site Info and you can require it um, I think I say how to do it in a minute um, but we also add it to the error site so when somebody goes to a site they've either got the wrong URL um, or they more importantly um, they've been given a URL to a site but they can't get in because they're not a member um, they will see the error page and they can use the contact us tool from the error page if you add it and then the um, email that is sent can go to the person who owns the site that they couldn't get into which is really good you can also add it to the gateway site um, which is public and other public sites so if someone can't actually log in you know they, they can't get into a site to send a message um, and we would uh, you can add an, a capture to the message to stop you being spammed so if you're having it on public sites you need to do that so this is uh, the gateway site, um, as you can see, uh, with by the username and password box at the top. I haven't logged in, but I'm seeing the contact us tool. So that just shows how somebody who's not logged in can actually get in touch with, um, you know, the, the, the service desk or in this case, probably the service desk. Whereas, you know, I mean, you could put something on the front page saying, if you can't log in, please, you know, um, but then you wouldn't have the necessary details so you can just stick it to the gateway on the gateway page and um, this is the error site and i'm going to there's a separate video to show you how to set this up actually so as you can see uh, this is the site unavailable site when you have mucked up the url and it's got the contact us tool on it amazing eh? and again um as i said before just to stress if you click on the problem with content uh, you can actually contact the people who uh, like own the site um assuming it's a it's a valid site which you just don't have access to so you can send a message saying help i'm on your course can you please add me to to your site so there's a quick recipe here um to add to the uh, error site now i won't really go through this this is i did this before i made the video but if you know the sites tool and how to do this it's fine but basically what you can do is you can get to the site unavailable page and then you can add um, an extra bit to the bottom of the page which is the contact us tool so watch me video that's the url and it's actually at the end as well so the way we configured it locally and this is something you do in the sakai properties file so that might be slightly beyond you but you can get your sysadmin to do it you need to supply the service desk email address assuming that's how it works uh, if you're using a uh, suggestions box you can um, add a url to that um, to that but you don't have to have that suggestions box column showing so you can have three columns or I think you can have as many columns as you want actually there'll be an email address for reporting bugs you can change the text on the page so if you don't like our wording um, you can you can modify it yourself and put whatever you want you can add a capture for public use and in order to, to get it on every single site a bit like site info you need these two things here to be in your Sakai properties file so obviously the sysadmin could do that and usually it's got site info in there as well so you'd actually add the, the feedback tool um, to the end of the site info and that, that's it I uh, can't really uh, answer questions because I'm not here <laughs> but I will be very happy to um, to, for you to send questions to that email address and that URL and that QR code takes you to the um, how-to guide to set it up on the uh, on the error site and yeah I can certainly give instructions on how to get it added to the front page as well and any of the, the other things that might have sounded slightly complicated um, that I was explaining and I'd be really happy to hear from you because it's a great tool and it it wasn't really deployed correctly uh, in the past so some of these things didn't work correctly perhaps I should have said that earlier on so so really with um, Sakai 23 it's it's been done properly and you can actually do everything I've 
perhaps I had on the um, on the slides there. So I see I have got about 10 seconds left, so I'll leave it there, and yeah, please do get in touch. Uh, hi. Uh, he doesn't um, even... Sorry, I couldn't be with you in person. He doesn't even have 10 seconds left. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, oops, that's the wrong screen. Uh, Hannah, you are up next. Hannah's going to talk to us about Scorum, which I'm very eager to hear about, so you can... Uh, start sharing your screen, Anna. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here today. I am going to be chatting about SCORM. I'll be talking a little bit today about how um, we use SCORM in one way at University of Dayton in our LMS. Um, I am an instructional designer at University of Dayton, and there are a couple programs that we use that um, we've been adding some elements of SCORM into lately to help kind of give um, the feeling of instructor presence for the student, as well as the effect of instructor presence when our instructors aren't necessarily able to attend to every student in the asynchronous setting. Um, so we know as in as educators or um, maybe as instructional designers that um, timely feedback and having instructor presence and um, formative assessment for the student is really key, and it's a an important part in um, building a positive student experience and helping to facilitate learning in a way that's productive for our students. Um, and this can be a challenge in the asynchronous classroom. We have a particular program that I work on that I'll be sharing about today where our um, students are the program's fully asynchronous. It's an online LLM program, so a master's of law. A lot of our students are coming from different countries and different time zones. We have very large rosters and the rosters or the cl classes are often taught by adjuncts who have high time demands. Um, and so they're not able to be meeting one-to-one -one with the students and giving long detailed individualized feedback um, for every single student and every assignment. And so one way that we have kind of creatively built in instructor presence into this program here, this online LLM program, is by using the SCORM tool in Isidore. I'll give you a demonstration, or in Sakai, excuse me, Isidore is our iteration of Sakai. Um, this is a little rundown of what I'm about to show you a demonstration of, but we have our Sakai LMS and then we use a SCORM player um, as opposed to using SCORM Cloud or something else um, to upload the packages and then they're uploaded as an assignment and students complete these interactive lecture packages that you'll see in a moment where they get um, a, a piece of information, they get some content delivery, they get a chance to try their hand at the topic and try a question and then they get feedback from the instructor that's been pre-recorded and built into this lecture package that we build on Articulate Storyline, um, Articulate 360. We use Storyline, you can also use RISE. I've done some of these on RISE before um, and the one I'll show you is, is done on Storyline. And then this is put into the SCORM player, the student completes it as an assignment and they get um, a pretty interactive experience with the content. And we've um, just started this new format in our online LLM program this past semester, and we've gotten really great student feedback. The actual building of these packages in incorporates a lot of instructional designer and subject matter expert collaboration. It takes a lot of collaboration to get these built, but in the end, it leads to a really positive student experience. So I'll take a look at what I'm talking about here. Um, this is a site that student might see. So they have their module here. Um, they would have a module introduction video. They would have a series of tasks to complete. But the very first thing that they have to complete is this interactive lecture to which I've been um, talking about here. So they click on it and ours loads in a new tab, um, but you can embed um, using the SCORM player, you can embed the um, assignment in the page as well. Um, but for just kind of user interface and, and the flow workflow for students, we prefer to have it in a new tab. So their lecture would open here. Again, this is built in Articulate um, Storyline. And the student first watches a mini lecture. So it's a short video and the video um, is a lecture that's been planned out by an instructor. This is one of our online LLM instructors. They watch the video and then they get to a question at the end of the video. And then in Storyline, I've built out the question. So the student um, then gets an, a couple of attempts at the question. If they get it wrong for the first time, 
then they have a chance to try again. Sorry, this arrow is taking a moment <laughs> to go. There we go. So um, they'll have a second attempt. If they get it wrong, a second attempt, then they're going to be forced into an explanation video that's recorded by the instructor. And if they um, got it right, they have the choice to either watch the explanation video or move forward on their own. So the explanation video is very short, but it just um, gives some of that instructor feedback and they're running through the scenario. And um, it doesn't have to be done just, you know, in law courses. This is a, a good format to follow. Um, for you know, maths and sciences, asking students to attempt a problem and then coming back and helping run through it with them. Um, so then the student would go on to the next activity and they would go through the same thing for their entire lecture package. When they come back to their um, site here, it um, through the SCORM player, it um, marks that they've completed it, it registers, and then in the um, player, we can see what the instructors and, and anyone else who's an instructor in the site can see how the student did and their score on that from the reporting. Um, so I think that was just a little, there might be some time for questions. So that oh, might not have great. filled yeah, my Dave, whole time, but yeah, um, Dave's, that's Dave's just a asking one that I want to know too. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave is saying, so the design of the course is done in Articulate and the SCORM player is handling the logic of forwarding and repeated attempts and all that? No, that's done in Storyline. So that's built out in Storyline. You can also do it in RISE. RISE just offers a few. Yeah, SCORM is really old. The The package you just saw is done, is exported on like 2004. That's like the, the yeah, it's really old. But it um, when you do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it works though. Um okay. But yeah, it's it's done through Storyline. So um, all of the kind of triggers are built in in Storyline and the reporting of the score is built in in Storyline as well. That's set up in the Storyline setting or you could set it up, um, you know, your flow of material in something like Rise. And then in the SCORM player, it just gives the report and helps us to send it through to assignments. Excellent. Yeah, you're getting two questions from the two different people. Same question. What so SCORM player, are you, player are you using? Yep. Is there someone else from University of Dayton on this call who can answer the question for me? I don't know. Wilma, you I would have to know, get back you? to you. I would it's, have to get back to you. It's the one that's it's... sort of built into Sakai, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's, in... a, it's a SCORM player that, that we have. Yeah, it's yeah. integrated with Sakai. I, if someone else on my team uh, is on the this. The SCORM player is a contrib tool. Okay. So Thank you, it's Wilma. not bundled with Corsakai, but it can be installed okay. um, at no charge. Thank yeah. you, Wilma. There you go. Excellent. And Miguel is answering the question too. So good. Excellent. Oh, that's that's really good. And I'm I'm gonna make a comment, but I'm I'm imagining that um the the mapping out of all these branches is the the really, really hard part. Right. And that's where that kind of pre-work, it's a very heavy workload. Um in the development, the course development process between the instructional designer and the SME. Right. But once the course is built, it's a very low lift for the adjunct faculty who is facilitating the course. So that's kind of the method it was it was made for is we have these courses with large rosters and how do we get the students a good instructor experience without an instructor who's able to constantly be there? Um, yeah, so that's kind of where and the so background Nadia is asking one final question, then Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, but but she's saying, um, what type of feedback are you getting for this type of instruction versus live instruction? If kids had a choice, would they go live? Okay, maybe they don't have a choice. This is way better than just reading a book. But what do you think? Right. So it's not the same as having a fully synchronous class. The students do get um, live sessions. So there are opportunities to meet with the instructor. The instructor is giving some personalized feedback. It's just um, trying to find a way to give as much feedback as possible and make instructor presence in a course um, where otherwise there might not be very much. Um, but as far as that live, they're not meeting weekly. So they're not getting right. that weekly okay. feedback. Um, but it is a good um, replacement to the in-person back and forth of the yeah. learning process. Excellent. With excellent. You're getting a lot of good comments. So this is, you know, well done. Thank you, Hannah. That's excellent. But it's time to move on for our last session of this, the the morning uh, lightning talks. And it, uh, your Matt is in Hawaii, so it's really early in the morning for you, sir. <laughs> but I'm going to turn it over to you and let you go ahead and, and start, start sharing your screen. There you go. Thanks, Martin. Hey everyone, um, 
My name is Matt Parkon. I'm an instructional designer with the University of Hawaii System. And for the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about how to elevate the accessibility of your content in Sakai, specifically um, using the accessibility checker. So just to start things off, uh, to give a good uh, frame of mind, I'm uh, going to provide some statistics. So according to an EDUCAUSE 2020 student technology report of the, of the students who were surveyed, 13% uh, of them uh, reported having some sort of disability. Uh, now keep in mind that of those survey, of those 13%, 44% uh, do not register with their campus disability services office. So that number, uh, that 13%, uh, or even at your campus, uh, might be lower, uh, might be higher as the number of students with uh, playing disabilities, right? Uh, that was in this survey, 46% uh, said they had a learning disability, and then 12% had some sort of uh, vision or hearing impairment. So it's a relatively, it's quite a, a small number, uh, a small population, but it's a, a population nonetheless that we should always keep in mind. So, um, you know, with this, with accessibility, um, you know, although there are laws and regulations saying we need to do it, uh, that shouldn't be the real reason. We should actually uh, make our uh, make sure our content is accessible uh, just to be uh, uh, fair to everybody, right? To all students. <clears throat> all right, so the accessibility checker, uh, it's a nice little tool that could help us in Sakai. Um, and it, it's a checker. So it checks for accessibility of content that you create using uh, the embedded rich text editor, right? And the nice thing about it is that it checks for it, but it also can do quick fixes that fix things automatically. So you don't have to work, uh, figure out how to go about it, doing a fix. Or uh, you might require you to, uh, or you might require manual intervention. So you, you have to input text or uh, do a manual fix, right? So uh, the checker itself, it's a third party add in. So it doesn't automatically come with Sakai, uh, it's available. I think it's, it's a licensing uh, guideline or agreement or some licensing uh, thing that prevents it from being automatically added. But it is, it can be added and it, uh, 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 but just can't, doesn't come bundled in automatically, right? Um, I was gonna do a quick poll, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip this. Uh, just to get a feel of if uh, for folks familiarity with the with the uh, accessibility checker so let's just People go ahead in, the, in the chat they can just uh, let it you know that they're doing it so. oh yeah okay yeah go ahead you should do it and then do it in chat and then i'll have yeah. a re we'll have a record for it so uh, using chat uh just let say uh, you know, indicate whether you've used the accessibility checker or not uh that'll be great Okay, I don't have my chat window open, so I'm just going to continue. But then, uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. I'll watch I'll for check you. it after. Uh, <clears throat> all right, thank you. All right, let me go switch gears. We'll go into uh, Sakai and show you how it works. We uh, look at uh, test drive a bit. So here I am in my uh, my content editor, right? So the accessibility checker, if it's enabled, is this little icon here uh, with the the person inside the circle, you see there it says check accessibility. Um, so if I click on that, so I have already stuff already set in here, right? Um, click on that and it's going to run through all the content and let me know uh, what uh, alert to me what uh, needs to be checked. Oops. So here's telling me um, I have a header here. Uh, it's just text that's bolded. For a screen reader to read it, it'll just read it as text. But visually, uh, we're making it uh, known visually that well, this is uh, the title or some headers. So uh, uh, screen readers doesn't don't know the difference, right? So it's telling me down here that I need to uh, apply uh, some sort of heading. So I can do a quick fix. It's going to apply that heading there, and we'll go to the next one, and then it's pointing out that um, this image here, uh, it's an image and not to forget that uh, I need to add alt text to it. And if it's just decorative, you can leave it blank or put double empty quotes or put null and then the, the screen reader will uh, skip over it, All right? So I can just ignore this. 
to like go slow. Let's just skip the next one. <clears throat> okay. And here it's telling me that, um, pointing out that my table, right? So table's a little tricky. And it's telling me that uh, you need to apply headers to or uh, to the headers themselves in the table, right? So you can see it there a little bit. Uh, now, it tells you, depending on your table setup, uh, you can apply headers uh, to the row, first rows horizontally or vertically or both. So you need to uh, indicate that there. Uh, in my case, it's horizontal. So if I just do a quick fix and it'll apply the headings to these here, all right? So let's do that. And let's run through everything there all, on that table. So I'm just going to skip, skip ahead. And then you get to this point here where there's another uh, image. So I have an image here with a laptop on a desk. All right. So it's telling me again that I need alt text for it. So let's just put for uh, NT desk with laptop so that the screen reader can read it. A uh, good rule of thumb when you uh, use Alt, when you enter alt text, if you're not already aware, uh, try to be as brief or descriptive as you can. And also, if you put a period at the end, uh, the screen reader will pause for the period before going on to the next piece of content. So that's otherwise, it's just going to read through it and go directly. So it helps folks using screen readers if you do that. Right. So I'll just fix. Okay. Now, um, let's just stop this. So it, it checks for uh, the main accessibility uh, items. Uh, it doesn't check for everything. Uh, so in this document here, or this, uh, I, we, I have colored text here. So some other checkers, uh, like Grapple Docs, things like that, if you use uh, Google Docs, they uh, check for a lot of uh, little things. Like this one here would be uh, contrast, right? Color contrast. So if a person has some visual, visual impairment or color blindness uh, may not make this out. For us, we can barely make it out, but we can make it out. So for some folks uh, may not, that may be really, really difficult to make out. So uh, it doesn't check for everything, but checks for most of the major things. Uh, and that's the accessibility checker in a nutshell. Okay. So nice. were there any questions? I'll, I'll tell you, Matt, that uh, I saw, I counted eight, yes, we use accessibility checker, and four, no, we don't. Uh, so, you know, sort of two to one. Okay. In terms of responses. That's great. That's great. All right. And and Alan Regan from Pepperdine says that they move the checker button to the very first one to raise awareness. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. I'll let that, I'll let my uh, programmers know about that. Yeah. So other questions for Matt? Thanks for sharing that. Oh, thanks, Lee. Okay, so very good. We're at uh, UH Hilo. Thank you. So, okay. Um, well, so that that wraps up our first lightning talk, and um, we will have another right lightning talk this afternoon or in in a few hours. But I will turn it back over to Wilma, and um, we we're finished with this one. I, I appreciate all four of you. I, I feel like boy, we really rushed, but it always feels rushed. And there were questions that I wanted to ask, but. That's the whole point of the Sakai uh, virtual conferences that you interact with people, even as Dr. Chuck says, in the virtual hallways. So use the Sakai site to, to talk to each other, get to know each other, chat with each other and ask questions. Uh, it's a really open community. So Wilma, yeah. what do we need to do next? Absolutely. Um, just want to mention real quick that if you didn't have questions that you um, didn't get answered or you think of new ones, um, check out the conversations area in the Sakai virtual conference site. And there should be a topic already in there for each of the sessions. So you can post um, a message there if you want to ask the presenters something or just kind of um, share some information. So feel free to use that. And um, our next session is coming up at 1140. So in about 10 minutes, um, we're going to have um, some uh, a, an eye break things session from um, Christina about QA. So looking forward to that. We'll see you over there in about 10 minutes. Thanks, everyone.